All right. Uh, good to see everyone here. Um, and I'm glad that you all put on this forum. And thanks for all the previous speakers and everything that you've shared. I hope that uh, this information that I'm presenting today is helpful and um, contributes to, to the larger discussion around putting more cultural fire on the ground in Karuk and Yurok territories and throughout California and beyond. Um, so a part of the research that I was engaged in as a part of my dissertation that many of you um, through WKRP and the Karuk and Yurok tribes have supported, and of course, the Cultural Fire Management Council have supported, um, was oriented around Hazel. And so this work really picked up where uh, Frank left off um, in terms of his own dissertation research. Uh, and, and so I'm, I'll present to you today some of the outcomes from those uh, years of data collection that we've been doing around Hazel um, at various cultural and prescribed fire sites. So as Margot spoke, spoke to earlier, um, Hazel is really critical to um, Yurok and Karuk culture in terms of basket weaving. And this is just really basic um, what the cycle is in terms of generating these nice straight shoots that are important for basket weaving. First, of course, you have to burn the hazel. And then uh, one grow after one growing season, um, after the burn, hazel produces these nice straight shoots, um, which is, has long been known by basket weavers. And so one of the objectives of this research was really to um, quantify that and document it um, for various fire managers, land managers, and so on. Um, so uh, hopefully this research can be used to uh, enact some of these uh, policies that were brought up so that there's more cultural fire. Um, and so to build on that, these straight stems, which you see this photo that uh, Frank took um, on the left, unpeeled hazel stems, and here they are peeled um, and then they're integrated into baskets um, like this basket for pounding acorns um, and the, this, this baby cradle basket. And so these are just some, uh, in terms of uh, one of these baby cradle baskets, which are in high demand throughout the region, uh, approximately 300, you know, depending on the weaving style and who's weaving, um, hazelnut stems are used to make just one of these baskets. Um, and I'm sure, you know, this is just to give you some context, but uh, baskets are sold for upwards of $800, um, depending, you know, um, especially if you don't have a basket weaver in your own family. Um, and so some basket weavers weave up to 10 of these baskets a year, um, which would mean that they need quite a, quite a few hazelnut stems. And if those hazelnut stems are dependent on fire and there's not enough fire on the landscape, then, um, then there's gonna be a problem, um, right? In terms of maintaining this important cultural aspect. And so here's Margot and uh, one of their grandkids. Um, and I think this is just a, this is actually a quote that Margo made uh, at, I believe, the Northern California Prescribed Fire Council meeting in 2019. Um, and so the Trex burns, of course, have really uh, increased the number of hazelnut stems in particular. And so now there's more baskets for um, the next generation, which is really powerful. Another thing that actually Margot just said um, is that we're a part of the ecosystem, right? Um, and so that's kind of one of the things that we set out to test uh, using, um, using the scientific language of ecology, so to speak, because so often ecology only sees humans as negative uh, 
members of the ecosystem, so to speak. But the goal with this project is to show that, well, actually, uh, certain human cultures have a positive effect um, on the ecology and uh, do not see themselves as oppositional to other species or seeking to control other species, um, but really see themselves as a part of it and have a relationship. Um, and those indigenous relationships in the Klamath Mountains are really key to maintaining uh, balance, of course, as is often stated um, by Karuk and Yurok cultural practitioners. So the research questions that guided this, uh, um, we framed it kind of in this larger uh, ecological theory of ecosystem engineering, which posits that there's actually that humans can have a positive impact and feedback on ecological and cultural processes, right? And then we also wanted to test whether or not uh, cultural burning actually alters species assemblages, um, wherein in the absence of fire, uh, plant communities may actually shift to become something completely different. And so certainly as you see in this background, this uh, beautifully burned um, hazel grove with black oak in the overstory, um, without fire, uh, we see hazel in decline. Um, but with fire, we see hazel in particular uh, at really high densities. And I'll show you some of the data shortly. And lastly, um, we sought to ask how fire and resource governance um, in both pre-colonial and contemporary contexts affect this, the cultural fire geography uh, and basketry stem availability and gathering, gathering practices. So how have these shifts in governance that you have all discussed, um, how has that affected access to these resources um, and the availability of hazelnut basketry stems? So we established uh, 48 um, plots for monitoring, both pre and post burn. We recorded the basketry quality and the total number of hazelnut stems. We measured both the stem length and the diameters um, on each of these of 10 shrubs in these plots. Um, we also recorded the shrub densities uh, in each of these plots. Um, so the total number of shrubs in this 400 square meter area. And we also included other variables that we thought would affect uh, hazelnut stem regrowth and quality, um, including burn seasonality, overstory basal area, and ungulate brows. Um, so we also went out with basket weavers and recorded um, where they decided to gather, uh, how far they had to go to gather. Um, and then once they were at the gathering sites, um, we used the number of stems that they were able to gather uh, as a measure of uh, the quality of the site. And so over this um, four or five year period, uh, we observed over 90 folks gathering, um, the majority of which were women, um, and the majority of which were two sites that have been burned three or more times um, in the past uh, 30 years. So you all are aware of this region, of course, but uh, this is these are where the plots are located. Um, a lot of plots where the Cultural Fire Management Council have been burnt, has been burning, and then other plots um, throughout uh, where the Klamath Trex has been burning in Kuduk territory as well. So the outcome of monitoring these plots over uh, this time span is that we see that burning um, one year uh, or one growing season after a burn 
produces these basketry quality stems at much higher rates than even two years after a burn and then three or more years after uh, a cultural burn, um, there are much fewer basketry stems um, that are being produced in these, at these sites. So fire needs to occur regularly and frequently um, in order to maintain this resource for basket weavers. We also saw um, in Yurok territory in particular, uh, where folks have maintained the practice of, or have been able to because of um, greater uh, land sovereignty on the reservation um, than in areas in Kaduk territory where there's been much more massive levels of uh, land dispossession. Um, we see that uh, there's even areas where folks have been able to burn regularly for hazel in particular. And so we see that those areas have higher on average densities of shrubs in those areas that they've been able to burn frequently. And so that was an interesting observation that those areas that are burned regularly also really support hazelnut in particular. Um, whereas those sites um, in both territories where cultural fire is only recently being reintroduced, um, typically in, in areas where fire has been excluded, uh, that the density of shrubs is much less, uh, significantly so, um, over here. So um, fire, we need more fire on the landscape in order to, again, support basket weaving. Um, and this, again, pretty much shows the same thing in a different way, which is that from observing basket weavers and their gathering, basket weavers who were gathering at culturally burned sites um, were able to gather uh, a hypothetical number of basketry stems, about 350, if I recall correct, um, quick, more quickly because they didn't have to travel as far. Um, and as I showed in the last slide, uh, in the culturally burned sites, there were typically higher densities of hazelnut shrubs. Um, and so all of this improves uh, the rate of gathering. And so the amount of time having to spend looking and gathering for um, basketry stems is reduced compared to even wildfire, where of course, um, you're not basket weavers aren't as familiar with where the hazelnut shrubs are because those areas ha are, have not been uh, burned for that purpose, right? And then of course, uh, at least in the time period that I was uh, in the field, um, most of the wildfires were had occurred in at sites that were fairly far from where the basket weavers lived. And then of course you can contrast all of this with fire exclusion wherein there are very few quality basketry stems. Um, and so you basket weavers cannot actually gather um, the same number of stems um, as in wildfire culturally burned sites. Um, and then quickly here, because I know I'm running out of time, uh, or I might be over time, so feel free to stop, um, stop me, Frank. Uh, but there were uh, some other variables that we studied around um, stem length, which is an important um, measure for basket weavers. Particularly longer stems are more functional because you can cut them into smaller sizes uh, and um, and can be used uh, in more diverse ways. Um, but really, uh, short stems are good for different types of basket weaving projects, right? But nonetheless, we found that there was this difference between um, hardwood and conifer overstories, wherein um, baskets or hazel growing in the understory of hardwoods um, produced longer stem lengths on average. We also looked at these variables in terms of burn season. Um, and so 
burns took place at various times that we studied these plants. And so we also saw differences in stem diameter. So of course, with a longer uh, growing season, if it's burned in the summer or in the fall, blue being summer and green being fall, we saw that there were larger st stem diameters at those sites on average. We also saw that um, stem diameters decreased actually as basal area at the site um, increased. Um, I think this is my one of my last slides, but we also, there was a clear effect of ungulate brows on reducing the number of basketry stems available. So there is a uh, interspecific interspecies competition for uh, hazel because it's, it's tasty stuff for uh, deer and elk and, and goats we found out in uh, Happy Camp. Um, there's more data. Uh, if you're interested, if you have, if you, if you have any questions, I'd love to hear them. Um, big shout out and thank you to all the basket weavers who really were fundamental uh, and all the fire, fire leaders in the region that made this happen. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Tony. Um, we're, I don't see any specific question and answers to you on this, and you did go a little bit over, but I want to honor Clark, given her the full amount of time, and we'll just shorten my time or our panel discussion at the end. So thank you, Tony. Really appreciate that. It's a good setup for Clark and then for my little wrap-up at the end. Go ahead, Clark. You have the, you have the, you have the screen. It is indeed. Thank you so much. Um, here, I'm just going to share and get started. Um, so I just want to introduce myself first, uh, first of all. My name is Clark Knight and I'm a PhD candidate at UC Berkeley. I'm actually graduating next Monday, so it's pretty exciting. Um, and I want to present some of the research that I've done as part of my PhD. Um, in particular, uh, a chapter that um, I collaborated on with these folks here shown at the right, and it's entitled Land Management Explains Major Trends in Forest Biomass Over the Past 3,000 Years in California's Klamath Mountains. And I want to introduce what my field is. So I'm a paleoecologist, and this is a pretty broad field, but basically what it is, is it entails the reconstruction of past ecological patterns and dynamics. And as I mentioned, it's a broad field, so it includes things from, you know, land use history, archival documentation, um, long-term monitoring, as well as paleoecological records, um, such as those derived from lake sediments, ice cores, and tree rings. And I show pictures of lakes here because my work has primarily been in lakes. And, um, you know, these records have clear applications to restoration ecology and a lot of the work that um, you folks are doing because many ecological processes take place over decades to centuries. So it takes a long time for something to play out. If it, even if it occurred 200 years ago, it might still be um, playing out today. And so with my work, what I wanted to do was incorporate the fate of multiple generations of tree populations under different climatic stressors and different land managers um, to provide more relevant context than can be gleaned just from uh, short-term records alone. And in particular, what I wanna show you today is this reconstruction of forest density um, or forest biomass and fire history that I uh, was able to produce from um, pollen from lake sediments, as well as fire scars from tree stumps and then the combination of that with uh, traditional ecological knowledge um, from the Karuk and Yurok tribes. And so by way of introduction, um, I know that this is an area in the northwestern part of California that has had native stewardship since at least the terminal Pleistocene. And that specifically has entailed the sophisticated application of fire technologies, which have evolved over time, um, but they've been on the landscape and, and have been applied by the Karuk and the Yurok as well as other um, tribe, uh, tribes in the area. Um, I read in the literature that there's something around 70 different uses of fire in this area. And as we've seen today is that a lot of these management activities are ongoing and um, that includes prescribed fire and cultural fire as well. And so I wanted just to show a map uh, from the Native Land Project. And, you know, it's, it's really Im important to me to recognize that these areas, uh, this area that I worked in Six Rivers National Forest is on the traditional territory of the Yurok and the Karuk, and there are numerous other tribes in this area. And as my research progressed and I started to delve into the paleoecology of this area, it became clear that the indigenous presence on the landscape would be a critical part in understanding this area's historical ecology. 
um, particularly the cultural burning practices and the forest stewardship that these tribes carried out for millennia and that's going on today. And uh, a critical person to that was actually Frank Blake, um, all of you know, um, and he, he was really critical to the development of this research. I'll be returning to these ideas um, shortly. But what I first wanted to mention was, you know, this indigenous influence uh, take, took many forms, as I mentioned, like the cultural burning practices. And then in terms of today, this is a, a picture from some of Frank's um, recent research in fire management today, the burning of uh, bear grass. There you can see there's a high density of bear grass in this area. Um, it's also a valued uh, basket tree resource that needs fire. Um, to, to give the desired result. So that's just one nice example of what's going on today. And I wanted to um, orient you to what, uh, because I'm reconstructing biomass, to what low biomass versus high biomass forest conditions really look like. And so these are, this top panel illustrates high, uh, low biomass forest conditions. And what I want you to notice here is that this is an area where there's, you know, single trees and clumps of trees, as well as really high visibility. Um, if you were to stand in this forest, you could see actually quite far um, around you. And this picture that says Lake in Salmon area, this is actually a picture of Lake Hancock in the Marble Mountains. It was taken in 1910. So you can see um, over a hundred years ago, just how sparse the tree landscape was. And then um, these two photos on the bottom are pictures I took from my field work uh, up in the Klamath area. And they illustrate the high biomass forest conditions we see today. Um, you can see there's you know, no visibility. If you're standing in this forest, you would just see other trees. Um, it's really, really dense and overpacked in this area. And the, the major question I had with this research is trying to understand what is the extent to which climate and or human activity have influenced the major trends in reconstructed forest biomass over the past 3,000 years. And so this work was conducted on two lake sites in this area, um, Fish Lake shown here by the letter A, and then uh, Lake Agaram talk shown here in letter B. You'll also notice these red dots around the lake site. These are the GPS locations of the fire scar sites. And I'm going to be showing some fire scar data um, that was put together um, on behalf of, of some other folks, but was used in this research. So we took a mixed methods um, approach. So what we first did is we combined uh, tribal ethnography. So there's been uh, publications that have interviews with Karuk and Yurok members where they're discussing the forest landscape that were incredibly insightful um, and very important to the results of this work, as well as combining that with the, the vast traditional ecological knowledge that's been published about this area. And really coupling that with the empirical paleoecological records. So I'm going to be showing you a biomass reconstruction that's derived from the pollen record. And these are two images of pollen grains just to give you an idea of what pollen looks like if you're not familiar with seeing it under the microscope. And then using um, a fire history based on fire scars to help uh, give, a, give a history of the fire on this landscape. And then because our biomass record is derived from pollen, um, we wanted to use other lines of evidence to check these biomass numbers so just to understand how confident we could really be in this estimate. And so our first set of results um, really show from the native history that there was a substantial contribution um, from native fire to this fire regime. So historically speaking, both of these lake sites were gathering places for acorns and mushrooms. And in order to cultivate these crops, you really needed lower fuel levels and open forest conditions. And this is some of um, the results that came out of Dr. Frank Lake's 2007 dissertation, as well as his Tushingham and Bettinger 2013 paper. And just to give you an, an idea of the extent of this is that this area is thought to have supported a population of about two to 3,000 people before colonization, um, according to Tarkov and Tarkov 1975. In terms of the contemporary ethnographic record, um, you know, what tribal members have said is that they have long recognized that these traditional lands are very over enriched in biomass. And some work um, by Jennifer Sauerwein published in 2019 found that the crew compare the current forest conditions to quote an ecological cultural desert. So, you know, you can't have the kind of crop cultivation um, that was taking place in the past because of these really over enriched biomass conditions. And I think um, this quote sums it up nicely. This is from a Karuk elder um, quoted in, in Frank's dissertation. We've never had this much fuel on the ground. And so now I want to walk through the fire scar record because it really uh, links in nicely to all of the ethnographic and traditional ecological knowledge from this area. And just to kind of back up for a second, um, we use a fire scar record. And just to illustrate what a fire scar is, it's these little black lines, um, these scars and injuries that occur on a tree. 
um, when there's a fire burning at low intensity that, inner, that injures the bark cells. And so what happens is that the tree buries that wound. Um, and these are not fires that would kill the tree, they're low intensity, but they, they do wound them. And what's great is that, you know, you've probably heard of methods to figure out the age of tree by count, ages of tree by counting the rings. The same thing can be done for fire scars. So this is an example of a, of a dated um, tree cookie as they're called, uh, where you have the fire scars are also dated. So this is a really cool way of finding out past fire events. And so this is uh, some work that's been done in part with um, Dr. Eric Knapp. But what we found is that the fire scar record shows frequent fires between 1700 to 1900 AD. And so at Fish Lake, there was median uh, fire return interval of about every seven years between fires. And then at Lake Agaram, talk about every 12 years. And what's great, uh, what's interesting about this is that scars are an underestimate of fire on the landscape because not all fires will cause wounds. So these are actually an underestimate of how much fire. So there is probably more than what we're, than what we're seeing in this record. And what's also interesting is that the position of the scar actually can help um, suggest or indicate the time of year that that scar formed. And what's interesting about this area is that although there is lightning um, fires in this area, um, those typically peak in around June and July, whereas we know from um, the cultural, the traditional eco ecological knowledge is that cultural burning tends to occur in the late fall and early spring. And what we found is that the majority of the scars, 89 to 90% of the scars, um, actually occurred in the late wood or dormant wood, as it's called, which is uh, put down on the tree in this uh, late fall period. So that was suggestive to us that actually a lot of these scars are probably as the result of cultural burning as opposed to lightning burning. And so just to give you um, an idea of what our biomass record looks like, um, this is biomass. We have megagrams per hectare on the y-axis, and then we have um, it's called calibrated years BP on the x-axis. It's um, a form of um, looking at time, but um, calibrated years just refers to year zero being 1950 AD. And so actually our last data point here on the right-hand side is actually from 2008 AD. And then it goes back 3,300 years from that. So um, this is our data. I've, I've put in the two pictures of the low biomass environment on the bottom and then the high biomass environment on the top just to kind of reorient you to what these numbers might mean. And what we see is that over 3,000 years at, these, at this site, this is for Lake Agaramtok, um, is that there's very low biomass. Yes, it does vary, um, but it's really only until the last 50 years or so of data, this, these data points on the right-hand side here, where you see this massive increase in biomass on the landscape. And so effectively what we're seeing is that in the last 50 years or so, um, the amount of biomass on the landscape is greater than at any point in the last 3,000 years. It's unprecedented in this record. And I think that that's a really important finding. And it also just goes to show um, that three millennia of uh, indigenous stewardship was probably really keeping these values um, under um, about 200 megagrams per hectare. And in fact, if you look at the median tree biomass um, till before colonization, which occurred around 1850 in this area, it was about 104 megagrams per hectare. This is really quite low numbers. And so if you zoom in um, into the last 200 years or so, just to look at what's been going on with contemporary stewardship and since colonization, um, I have here the, the biomass on the y-axis still, and then I've shown the modeled years in terms of year AD, just to make it a little more interpretable. But if we go through it, you know, we can see in this record you know, this is when the gold rush invasion was starting to happen in this area. Um, the beginning of fire suppression really became effective in this part of California around 1920. Um, we had the creation of the National Forest, Six Rivers National Forest in 1947, and the beginning of timber harvest. And then, you know, what's interesting is we see this drop in biomass right after that, um, which is probably due to the removal of these mature trees that are producing the pollen that makes up this biomass record. And um, then in about the 1980s, we see the timber harvest restricted and then this massive increase uh, in biomass on the landscape, which we think is due to the really effective fire suppression uh, in this area. And so thus, my main findings were that the Kruk and, the Kruk and Yurok ethnographic data, as well as the fire scar histories, together are very suggestive that indigenous stewardship contributed substantially to this fire regime. Our biomass record also strongly suggests that frequent fire limited biomass 
relative to the potential productivity of these sites, which you can see today in these massive over 300 megagrams per hectare numbers. And then we are also pleasantly surprised that our, um, our biomass predictions were consistent across uh, independent lines of evidence, which gave us more confidence in them. And so uh, from my perspective, you know, integrating paleo empirical data with ethnographic records and traditional ecological knowledge is a really powerful way of understanding the ecology of the past. And it's something that I hope is incorporated more and more in this field. Um, from a restoration point of view, the contemporary forest biomass is unprecedented in 3000 years, which I think is a really important piece of information for land managers. And also the fact that indigenous forest and fire management was likely very critical to maintaining these forest conditions before colonization. And so if we want to think about returning to historical conditions and using his, uh, cultural practices, you know, my perspective is, is that we would need a really large scale intervention to move the forest towards any kind of historical fidelity over the past 3000 years. And it's my opinion that um, engagement with tribes and the restoration of native burning practices is a really good way of trying to move these forests um, back to any kind of historical fidelity that we've seen over millennia. So I want to say thank you to the numerous collaborators who um, helped me uh, along the way with this research and I'd be happy to answer your questions and I want to say thank you so much for listening and for inviting me. Thank you, Clark. Very great presentation. I really appreciate all the overview of the research you've been doing with a lot of us. Um, I don't see any particular things on the chat or the question and answer. So um, I would like to follow up with your and Tony's stuff and share my screen. And uh, if Jody can give me, see here if I can do this where, I don't know, I can't see myself, but I'm gonna share my screen. And yep, yeah, that's the one I wanna do. Okay, can you all see that slide there? Do you see a slide that has the yes. local, huh? Yes? Great. Can you adjust your video a little up? We can just see your shirt. Yeah, well, I, I'm trying to be able to see my screen behind it. So I'm gonna shut off my video, actually, if I can find that here. Um, and then I'm gonna talk about this slide. There we go. So, you know, one of the important things here, I think is really hitting home both at kind of the, the scale and the landscape diversity here is we look at the Fish Lake site that was just covered there, um, having a median fire return interval between three to five, uh, three to seven years from the work that we've done there. That picture shows the Yurok villages in the orange and then the Karuk villages going up to Lake Garam Talk that was also featured. And then where Tony did his hazel work were essentially uh, through this whole area of that left uh, figure there uh, from that initial work with Jeff Crawford and others. And then when we think about the, the gradient going from the village down in, in the lowlands and the river across these different forest types, there is interplay between lightning. But really the main critical thing, despite having a large lightning frequency in the Klamath Mountains, is that there is the intentional and purposeful use of fire across these habitats or vegetation zones for a variety of resources. Um, so, you know, one of the things that's still debated, and I have to come back to this again and again, and it's um, getting better here, but I still just wanted to put it in place. You know, uh, Vale back in his work in 1999 featured a Yurok, and this showed in the center figure here just that one area of the Yurok villages. But when you actually put in the context all the Karuk sorry, villages, no. yes? Um, could you start your slideshow? It didn't start it? I mean, we can see your top bar, and I think you've moved on to slide two, but we're still on slide one with the bull and lake on it. Oh, huh. okay. Because um, my screen shows it. That's not very good for me to come back around. So if I slideshow, start from the beginning. Great. You see that now? We saw should, this one, should this be one slide? We can still see the, the four slides to the left there. Let me switch. Um, How am I doing my screen scare? I'm the one botching this up. All right, so. So Bill's noting that you're probably just maybe sharing the wrong screen. Yeah, and that's why I need, and my thing isn't um, coming across to where now my toolbar is not helping me do it. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, 
I'm going to probably just quit this because um, it's not getting what I wanted to do. Um, you have to click on slide two so we can at least just see the next slide. But you can't still even see. Mm. There you go. Now we can see the second slide. Which is the ones of the fish lake? Yes. My two different screens are showing me way different presentations. Anyways. Would, would you like Jody to? Um, no, because I don't have this loaded up. Anyways. No um, Looks good. We can see fish lake. All right. So, but you have the, you have the multi-panel one there, right? Never mind. I yeah. just. Yep. We have slide two. Okay. But do you, but does it show the one that has the villages as the out boxes? Yes, and it says the debate. Yes, thank you. Okay, so that was part of the part of the thing there. Um, it's just when you put it in context of beginning to connect all the areas that would have shown tribal villages in this area, and then thinking each of those villages had a range of tribal networks and trail systems that went between them, like I showed in the prior one. Then we get down to now what it should be the cultural roles slide for everybody yes we can see that and you see fish, fish lake and the little blue circle in the top right and martin's ferry is in the bottom left of that general land office survey map but essentially this is the debate that i'm hearing today now is that oh cultural burning and patches were historically small didn't have a very big effect on the landscape and i just want to again you know have us quit um have us really question that in this example here, the General Office Survey map shows, again, a range of trail networks going to very specific vegetation types. And we've been able to use multiple lines of evidence. And so essentially, when you think about the cultural specificity and the diversity of burning amongst men and women for different types of hazel shoots and the seasonality, and then that difference of seasonality between lightning and, and intentional cultural burning, that you really have those things tailored to the biophysical setting, the particular aspect, slope position, the elevation, the canopy cover closure, and it's a succession of these different burning or successional stages of the serial stages of the different burning areas that were with, for desired fire frequencies that really affected the variability of ecological conditions that reflected those cultural processes. And so when we begin to put all this together, for me, it's you know now looking at a landscape picture again from like 1910 of the Capel fish dam area where they burned a hillside at the time of the fish dam that they created, but you also see these patchworks of diversity and it's just this one little hillside amongst many other that we could be featuring up and down the river between Kaduk and Yurok territory or for other tribes in the area. So I just wanted to end on that note um, and I can end, end my share and then bring us back around uh, to wrapping this up and see if there's any other questions for our speakers. Sorry about that. Anybody? I, uh, I, it, to keep myself from having to type this all in, uh, I'm abusing my presenter privilege to use my mic and ask you, Clark, how do you attach pollen grains to biomass? Yeah, um, that's, that's a great question. That was uh, an entire research paper in and of itself. It was a novel method that we came up with. Um, you know, in a nutshell, you have lake sediments, um, which contain grains of pollen from the vegetation around that lake site. And if you go and you sample um, a core, a lake sediment core, and um, count the pollen grains, and if you have a really good idea of um, the, the age of that core, the age of those sediments, um, then, uh, then you have what's called a pollen influx, which is the amount of pollen grains per centimeter squared per year. Um, and then what we did is we did really detailed spatial transects to find out the biomass around um, seven lake sites in this area. And so we found that there was a really strong linear re relationship between the amount of pollen going into the lake and the amount of pollen producing um, trees around that lake. And so we used um, a model based on that relationship to then calculate um, biomass in the past by counting pollen grains in the past. I hope that makes sense. It was, um, I'm simplifying a bit, but 
in, in essence, it, it's using this pollen record um, from the lake sediments to go back in time. And we did it specifically for the lakes in this area. So it was calibrated to Klamath area pollen, Klamath area lake sites. And um, it, it, was, it was a novel method. So this is the first time that it's been applied and it is a really cool way of getting biomass. I don't know that it would work everywhere, but um, we show that it could at least work here. So that, that's a really, I think, a cool way of getting at, at biomass. Great. I realize that we're uh, one minute over when we wanted to end the workshop, but there was a question here um, about being able to use fire scars to quantify carbon and if that was somehow being, I forget where that's at, but um, I, I lost it in the chat. But do you know of any way of using the reconstruction of the fire history record um, to look at carbon and then how that might be also for gauging for I think those are my questions, yeah. uh, Frank, and there was, there was two questions. One was if, if people had looked at the frequency of fire scarring under the kinds of burns that are like cultural burns, and if, if not, if that's something that people would be interested in studying. And then the second question was, given the unsustainable levels of biomass that your research is suggesting, I'm curious how many groups are, are still exploring trying to get carbon credits for forest management or whether we need to... Uh, recognize that we need to reduce our carbon. Well, I wish I had a, an answer to the first part of that question. I know the fire scar ecology for these bimodal um, uh, systems is not completely known how these scars form. Um, I, I was assuming in this research, I guess that, you know, with these cultural burns that were very frequent is that they would be producing the same kind of scar that you might see um, and would be indistinguishable, I guess, from the lightning based ignition except for the fact of the intrascar um, positionality. That was really the, the way that was suggested that suggested as cultural burning, but you do bring up a good point. And I, I actually don't know if there's been a study um, that's, that's looked at scars just in places with cultural fire. That's a great question. Um, I don't know if anyone else wants to try to tackle the, the, that second part you said about carbon credits. I'm not familiar with that. Uh, I'm not aware of any research that's being done. I know others are looking at carbon offsets and carbon credits. The Iraq Tribe has a carbon forestry project, but I don't know how many others are. And then there's also some questions around the applicability of that between the historical condition and then the vulnerability or the potential risk to higher dense stands of car sequestering carbon and tree plantations versus the risk of fire and, and disease and bugs and other factors. Um, well, I, I'm going to have to close this out, cut myself off on this one, and I wanted to thank all our uh, panelists for being here, especially those in my session and for the others that were invited to speak in the prior two. Um, really appreciate that for our attendees, and uh, I want to make note that we have a second WKRP uh, fire workshop, I believe, coming up on Thursday, June 10th, and if um, Jody or others can verify that and go into that a little bit for a preview of what we're going to have in the future. I'd appreciate that. And thank you again. Um, quickly, yes, June 10th is our next workshop um, focused on projects and things that we have going on um, for this year and, and, you know, years to come, but um, mainly focusing on our programs and projects uh, that that we have going on. I'll be reaching out to people shortly with all that information. All right, well, anything else from our planning committee um, or from anybody in the attendee side of it? All right, well, not seeing any. Thank you so much. I appreciate everybody's engagement in uh, joining us for the Western Klamath Restoration Partnership our fire workshop today. Thank you and have a good, wonderful day.